going forward, I am confident that the descendants here today and others who could not make it today, and maybe some are not even born yet, will come to the spot on Richmond Street where the fire occurred, where this plaque will be installed, and where the tears are not yet dry. And the story will be told, and the victims remembers as they should be. That's what it sounded like Wednesday in a downtown Toronto park at the unveiling ceremony of a plaque for the victims of the Phillips Garment Company fire. The fire happened 70 years ago, in 1950, in Toronto's historic garment district. If you've been reading the Canadian Jewish News recently, you might have seen the article about it. The plaque is being installed near the site where nine people were killed. Among the victims was the factory's owner, Philip Tchaikovsky. His 19-year-old son, Sidney, managed to escape, but he ran back inside to help, and he died too. And seven garment workers also were killed. Some were Holocaust survivors who had just recently arrived in the country through a special project to bring tailors to Canada after the Second World War. An inquiry later called the dress and coat factory the worst kind of death trap. The windows and doors had been kept locked to prevent burglaries, and fire safety inspections were not being done. Wednesday's public ceremony was supposed to help bring some closure to the families, but it also brought out the long-held private anguish, which both the workers' families and the owner's family clearly carry with them to this day. So my father uh, was the oldest son, and he lost his father months, just months before his bar mitzvah. Except one man described how my grandfather looked when they pulled him out of the building, and I fainted. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Thursday, October 7th, 2021. Welcome to the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. We're going to do this episode a little differently than you're used to. I'm going to bring you the story right from the scene of the ceremony. I went down there in person myself. One of the victims of the fire was Wilfred Gutson. He'd worked on a sewing machine in the Phillips factory. He'd immigrated to Canada with his family as a teenager from Vilna, but he was now married. He was in his 50s. And when he died in the fire, he left behind a handful of sons, including David, who is soon turning 82. It was David who a few years ago approached the city of Toronto armed with a bunch of old newspaper clippings about the fire and applied for the plaque. David was 10 when the fire happened. I never accepted his death. And I, at that time I didn't know that I did not accept his death. So it was a black hole in my life. His, my father's death... Uh, and certain other related circumstances resulted in, I'm not ashamed to say so, my arrested development. One thing I finally realized I had to uh, recall what happened. How old were you when I... In 1950 at the fire? I was uh, 10 years plus... Two and a half. So before your bar mitzvah, anyway. Pardon? Before your bar mitzvah. Oh yes. Well, that was a big pain. My father wasn't there. How did this work out today for you? Uh, does it? Did it live up to what you hoped would would happen? Oh, uh, it offered a certain degree of uh, closure. Did your family ever get compensation or anything? Very little. Very. very from from who? Union, or there was no union. Uh, uh, workman's compensation. She, my my mom looked forward to. She would get a ninety dollar check every month. <laughs> That's what we lived on. David encourages anyone listening to donate to a charity that helps families who've lost people in workplace accidents. The link is in our show notes. <laughs> The factory's owner, Philip Tchaikovsky, was also a Jewish immigrant, originally from Kiev. His death, along with the death of his 18-year-old son, Sidney, was doubly tragic for the family. But they haven't been able to be vocal about what they also suffered, mainly because their own loss was clouded by negative publicity. Bev Little is the oldest granddaughter. I was four and a half at the time and have... A lot of memories. I, as I mentioned when I was speaking, I shared a bedroom with Sydney. Uh, my grandfather was a sweet, wonderful person. Uh, I remember his sparkling blue eyes. 
Um, and you have them too. Yes. Uh, and I remember that afternoon just hearing shrieking in the house when I don't remember if it was my mother or my grandmother found out. It's something your family has had to live with since 1950. For sure. Um, I know how deeply it affected our mother. Uh, she didn't talk about it very much, except when she heard about a fire. or um, She couldn't stand the smell of a barbecue running, because after the fire, uh, somebody delivered their clothing that reeked of smoke. And you've never spoken really about it out in public till today. So... Let's, you know, like, how, how, does that, how has that been to live with that? I think I pretty much ignored all of that. And, you know, thinking back on it, there was no fire inspection. There were no safety rules. Uh, the insurance company told them to lock the windows or board the windows and lock the doors because they were concerned about theft. And uh, that was probably why it, it happened. Penny Fixel is another granddaughter of the owner. Our, our growing up in Toronto, and on occasion, um, I, someone would hear my last name and come over to me and ask me about my family. And to my shame, and also to my, uh, 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 just to bewilderment, I couldn't answer them. Except one man described how my grandfather looked when they pulled him out of the building and I fainted. That's horrible. That is horrible. I, I, I've never heard that. Yes. Have you been in touch with the families of the others who passed? And what about today? They're here. Are you? How does that? How was that to see them and and talk to them? I spoke to um, was it David Gutson? I spoke to him briefly because he was a young child when his father died, and uh, I read in the article that he taught his son how to shave because his father couldn't do that. Well, we realize that there's a lot of people here that are, share our story to a degree, and I'm glad they came, and I'm glad the plaque, but I think there is, moving forward, other things we can do. And I'm sure that my family, all intelligent and thoughtful and caring people, will want to see the right thing done for everybody. Such as a fund, uh, maybe some a fund. compensation? Well, uh, I don't know where the fund can go now, but maybe uh, a sense of... Um, looking to other countries who are still abusing garment workers all over the world. And that to me, and I'm sure to my cousin, that it's recently in the news. It's in the news. It, it's now it'll never be more than a tear drop away from what we should be doing to keep that story front and center. And it's never far away from anybody. Not so in this some point. kind of um, awareness campaign, fundraising yes. for uh, child workers or oh. workers in, the, in third world yes. countries. Absolutely. You said it. Thank you. Toronto City Councillor James Pasternak got the city to pass a motion of condolence last summer, and he shepherded the memorial plaque project. In June of 2020, the city passed a condolence motion to all the victims of the fire. So it's on the public record that the, the uh, city of Toronto recognizes this event as, as a local tragedy and remembers the victims. Now, um, we're close here outside to the Garment District, the Shmata District. It was a very famous area. Lots of Jewish people who came to work in these factories. Um, what do you know about this particular working conditions uh, of this particular factory? Well, back in those days, the workplace safety standards were not what they are today. So this site did have its issues about workplace safety. And clearly, when a, when a fire takes place in a small, confined space, the ability to get out is, is greatly reduced. So that's why it had such tragic consequences. Where the, the, the windows were blocked, though, and they were locked, and there were some chains, apparently. How does that happen? Yeah, so we get that from, we get that from newspaper reports. The city uh, was not doing the inspections. It, it really should have at the time. The issue was investigated by, by the mayor of the time, and, uh, and, of course, it came to city councillors to put in tougher regulations. It redefined much of the labour law and, and workplace safety that takes place in the city today. It was, it was a transformational event in that, in that regard. 
And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. If you like what you hear and you want to support great Jewish journalism, please join the CJN Circle. For $100, you can be a member and receive the magazines, the new Friday newspaper that's coming next month, and more benefits. Go to the cjn.ca and sign up. And I hope you don't mind, but the podcast is taking Monday, October 11th off. It's Thanksgiving, but it's also a big milestone birthday for me. No, I'm not telling you how old I am. But we'll be back on Tuesday with more in-depth stories for you. Meanwhile, we'll end today's episode with more from the Phillips Garment Fire Ceremony. At the, at the time of the fire, Spadina Avenue was Toronto's garment district. And there were workshops and factories of various sizes located throughout the neighborhood. Many of them owned and operated by Jewish people. The horrific disaster at the Phillips workshop was not an isolated incident. Workers died to a lack of safety and poor working conditions in workplaces around the world, notably in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York in 1911. It's important to note that while we commemorate this disaster, people continue to work in dangerous conditions around the world and disasters continue to claim lives. Mm-hmm.